he was brash, he was bullish. Let's go. Nothing was ever his fault. You couldn't take him anywhere. He's just a character as well, he's entertainment, and, you know, people that watch it on TV like to see people like this. Sometimes he crossed the line a little bit. Bollocks to you all. Ultimately, you forgave him his sins because he was such a character and he was such a good laugh to be with. If you ask anybody in the UK, name a poker player, they'll probably say Dave Willier. He was always going to have to be the centre of attention, and if he wasn't, he would do something that made him the centre of attention. He was a character. Some people didn't like him because he ended up with getting your money. I ain't got a pair, actually, right? I got two pairs. <laughs> that was a bit what naughty, much. wasn't it, Tony? They just caught me with bus tickets, I'll tell you what. He did bring the gift of laughter. The devil fish just made me laugh. That's not the best move I've made today, Paul. For me, he was the best character in the poker scene at all, at all times. Don't come any bigger than the devil fish. WSOP bracelet holder and current European player of the year. He loves the life and works as hard as he can. It's a bit of a James Bond lifestyle without the bullets, you know, thank God, these days. We used to have the bullets as well. You know, my mom and dad did the best and that's all you can do. And then they kicked me up the ass out the door when I was 15 and I had to go make a life for myself. And I'm glad they did because now it toughened me up, you know, you've got to be, you know, you can't be, uh, if you're travelling around the place I used to travel, you know, you can't really be a mammy's boy. But nobody ever helped, it was all trial and error, you had to, you, had, you went skint, you know, you had to, I mean, I went skint for, I've been skint more times than uh, a lot of people. But, um, you know, you had, you had to learn, the hard way. I knew Dave for about 15 years. You get people in life who have or a caricature and are slightly different in, in, in real life when you get to know them. But, you know, I would say that Dave was pretty similar to what you saw on television, what you saw around the bar, um, sort of being with him one-on-one. -on -one. It didn't kind of change much. He was a funny guy, but he was a very grumpy guy as well. He was a very proud man, family man. He didn't keep many people close to him, really. This day when you watch... Uh, you can see young, yeah, he quite just hairstyle. Like a <laughs> hippie style. <laughs> yeah, it's the first pawn shop, I think, yeah. Jewelry shop he put on those days uh, when he opening the shop, jewelry shop. This one is mom and dad. Unfortunately, I just miss only mom. Dad passed away before I met Dave for two years. Yeah, and mom still, yeah, mom, I still be with mom like uh, seven or eight years until she passed, passed away on last year. She same like Dave, mom. She's funny. She very enjoy her moment. Yeah, she like to play poker. Yes, <laughs> play card with Dave, yeah. His ex-wife, she very beautiful, Mandy. Yeah, Mandy. She not live far from me in North Philippi. They got four boys together. This, the boy, four boy, that one will be Steve, Chris, uh, Michael, and Mafu. And uh, now they grown up more now. put the family before anybody. Yeah, so why he care about the kid? So he got a lot of kid. He called about X, Y, care about Y. He been protects all his family. If somebody uh, hurt his family, he will not wait for anybody to help. He just sorted it out. That's when I had the Terry Griffiths haircut there, look, when I was younger, when I first stopped my pawnbroking business. Um, we got a, me and James Woods here, the actor. He loves poker. Same as Ben Affleck, he loves it. Me and Ben in a room there. Look like twins, don't we? I'm 33 years old when I met him. I think probably he would be 56 years old. He's still, he's still rock and roll. <laughs> 
I know only story or know about he talk about the gangster, but he not talk to me much because he knew I will be scared, scared of when he talk about that. One night, I don't know, one night he been fighting and he come back home with the clothes, with the thing tear. I, I think when I look at the camera, I think, oh, who is that? Like a mad people come to drink the bell. It's not, it's him. He been fighting. And he said he got problem with the large tie to protect his, um, uh, what's it called, nephew. So why he get to fight, yeah. Now we got daughter. He like to, uh, you know, his style, he like to uh, swear. Don't want to keep doing this all fucking day. You fucking idiot. Well, Go on, on stop fucking talking, get him so... Fucking hell, the beard is crying like a turtle. It's fucking massive. Since he got daughter, he stopped to swelling in the house. Yeah. He never... I think he calmed down a lot, yeah. He calmed down a lot. What's your dad's name? Your dad, dad's... David what? David Olias? Mm-hmm. Yeah. David Olias? Mm-hmm. Oh, they call, everybody call daddy devil fish, yeah? yeah. <laughs> I keep a lot of pictures. I keep a lot of story. I got book. Keep a lot of things for when she grown up, she want to find out. She will see what her daddy is very great, great man, yeah. This one, Rooney. It's him, and I think it's uh, Jimmy. Uh, yeah, Jimmy yeah. White. Yeah, yeah, Jimmy White, yeah. Jimmy White. Uh, they also been calling in the house. Yeah, I think, yeah. But um, when the day he poorly, they, they, they been calling him. A lot of people love him, a lot of people don't like him. He doesn't care. Lucy. Lucy. <laughs> Sorry. This one, <laughs> uh, this one, I just been take a photo <laughs> when uh, he just dressed up. He like to pray around, make fun in the morning. <laughs> and you know this, baby? Where daddy? Where daddy? Yeah? Oh. Yeah, quite young those days, yeah. And my Mar she was also young. Yeah. He was just a good guy, he had good morals. He was kind of the same off the table as he was on the table. He was not one of these guys that like, you know, as soon as the camera was on, he started performing or acting differently. He was always just the same, no matter whether there's cameras or not, whether he's on a night out, whether he's at dinner, whether you're around parents, whether you're around kids, he was just always the same, like cracking jokes and like, he liked to be the, uh, the entertainment, if you like, and uh, he was good at it. I don't think I can call it off with Ace High here. A little bit of steam out. Huh? Steam. <laughs> <laughs> I've been on some nights out with him, and you know he's had us all in stitches. I've been on some other nights out, and I had my fingers in my ears. Like he's one of them. Like if you catch him on a good night, he's he's the best company ever. Or he was the best company ever, and uh, yeah, he's uh, he's obviously a character. How come that shirt so tight on you? He could probably cover about been, four. He could cover four, he could cover four dead chairs with that. <laughs> he was so open. You know what I mean? He always spoke the truth and spoke his mind and. You know, he was not a shy person, let's be honest. And, um, you know, it's, you know, I would say that he was he's a, like a really loving family man. And, you know, he treated his um, kids really well and he had really tight relationships with his kids. And you know, when I went to his funeral, I could see, you know, how much, you know, uh, how close the family was. And, you know, he had a lot of kids. And, um, yeah, he was, uh, so he was a, a big family man. Sometimes he played like a bit of a Jack the Lad and um, come across like a bit of a, you know, rough, rough and ready hard man. But deep down, he was a bit of a softy too. Devilfish was uh, was the Devilfish on TV, was the Devilfish at home. That was him, there was no act. The caricature you saw was the same person when, when you peeled back the leather jacket, the rings, and the, uh, the hair that he, tried, that he always denied dying because he didn't want to be ginger. 
Well, we had a love-hate relationship from the first moment we met, really. We used to argue. I mean, I, just a couple of years ago, I remember driving down the M1 with him. We were going to Luton, and he was moaning and moaning and moaning. He'd start smoking cigars and drinking coffee, and he was coughing. He blamed me for that. So, uh, and then he wanted to go to the toilet. On, we were on the M1, he says, I want to go to the toilet. And he was one of these guys, if he wants something, he wants to do it now. So I, had to, I pulled over the whole shoulder and said, OK, go to the toilet over in that bush there. And uh, he got out, went to the toilet, and uh, I left him on the M1. We drove to the next junction, and I can just... Uh, I always remember that his, his uh, expression in my, in my rear view mirror of him, like, it's off a cartoon, shouting with, with his fist like that. So, I mean, my relationship with Dave, we were close, but we definitely, uh, it was a love-hate relationship. We used to fall out. Yeah. He definitely had a momentous impact on poker. He made more people want to play. I mean, I, I didn't play poker until I watched Late Night Poker and I sh saw Dave and Vicky Corrin and the guys play it. He just brought this, this infectiousness to the whole of the poker world. Um, and I think, I think it was so successful because he was actually deadly serious with some of the rubbish he used to come out with. People thought it was an act, it wasn't. I wish I'd have re-raised you, you know? I'm just saying, I didn't really raise you, but I'd have just doubled it, you know? I fancied, I just fancied that hand, I don't know why, that's why I doubled it, and I was right. Sometimes the old fish is spooky. Got lucky, damn. Let's go, baby. Yeah. That's <laughs> funny, you caught my hand dead right, and I blocked oh, yeah, him off yeah. the pot. Dave always liked to claim that he was the reason that poker became so popular in the UK, certainly. That his that his uh, presence on late night poker, in the within the poker community, propelled poker into this the stratospheric rise that it had between you know 2000 and 2007, and even though he used to go on about it, I think most of us in the business on the business side of it, in the TV side of poker, which I I eventually uh, got into recognised that, that you needed characters like Dave to engage with the audience. And they all, they all knew that, and they, 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 uh, they, they capitalised on it a lot. And so, to, you know, to some extent, David... David, I can't really call him David. I've got to call him Dave, or, or Devilfish. To some extent, Devil really, really helped to attract viewers, because he was entertaining. I hope you're watching the way I play down there, too. him many many times a long time ago for the first time uh, character unique um, uh, guy unique poker player um, he really was one of the first ones that made poker very popular in the UK and ultimately worldwide the personality he had and the charm uh, very witty there's always there was always a comment on his lips uh, that made you smile I really believe that there were far more unique characters back in the old days of poker than there are today. Today, you just have robotic kids that are really intelligent guys, very smart, but they don't have the personality and the characteristics of the old-time gamblers. And most all the high-stakes poker players in the old days were gamblers. I mean, they gambled big on sports, they gambled big on the golf course, they gambled big in the pit. I mean, they were gamblers at heart if they played high-stakes poker. But I think back at some of the unique characters in the history of poker, you know, guys like Puggy Pearson, uh, Amarillo Slim, Stu Unger, uh, Jack Strauss. These guys were unique characters, you know, back in the day. And, you know, if I compare today's players or not too distant ago, you know, you have to put the devil fish right there, David Elliott. I mean, this guy, if you were gonna compose a list of the most 
unique characters in the history of poker. The Devilfish has to be in the top five of everybody's list. I mean, this guy was a one of a kind character in the poker world, you know, and, and uh, you know, he was brazen, he was loud, he was brash, and he was good. I mean, really, really a good poker player, but uh, Devilfish was very good for poker, I thought, and uh, uh, extremely unique character. I just hope the battery's not flat. I haven't had it out for a long time. Well, every, everything still works anyway. Can't stand them posing bastards, can you? So I first met this devilfish gentleman. As I saw, was, we're in Cardiff, and uh, we were doing a late night poker TV show, and I met this guy in an elevator, and he looks at me and says, listen, son, I'll teach you everything you need to know. And I said, about what? And he says, everything. <laughs> and he, and from that day, I just, he was such a character. It was amazing. Coming up, it's Battle of the Egos as the mouths go into overdrive in the Premier League. I, you know, my job at the time was I was trying to get these players to play these televised poker tournaments, and the Delfish would always try and be later than everybody else. So there's, with like Phil Helmuth, Tony G, there's a competition about who could be the latest because they believed in the psychology, you know, that, that you know, the final one to the table had the psychological edge, but no one could beat the Devilfish on that one. Already, backs are up as the players have been waiting an hour for the fish. We're gonna start without you next time, for sure. You can't disrespect everybody like this. Everybody's upset at you. Tell the truth. Everyone's here waiting for you. I might go on tilt now. What the fuck's it got to do with you? They've already told me outside. You don't need to start shouting your big mouth off because of the TV camera. It has everything to do with him. He's been waiting for you. They're all screaming the big mouth off in the studio and acting tough, so I might have to knock some of these teeth out, actually. Because they're idiots, you know what I mean? They're all divas. They all think there's something special and we kept on waiting, you know what I mean? You'd always just be smiling and having a laugh. You know, he crossed the line so many times and he made my life hell sometimes, you know. You know, you've got a full TV production here ready to go and he would, like, just not be out of bed and I'm hammering down the door and he'd just, like, go away. And I'm like, I I'm not going away until you come, yeah. <laughs> so it's like dealing with a big child, you know. I never swore it, eh? Ask her. Go stand over there, you idiot. What's the matter with you? I'll swear at you in a minute. I like characters, yeah. I like people that stand out. Um, but of course, he could be really annoying. You know, he would, um, there were times where, you know, oh, there's something on my hotel room. Oh, thank you for that, yeah. Or you do this, you do that. But I just had an affection for him because he was a character from a different generation. He inspired so many people to play poker. Um, you, know, the, the, you know, the reading, the bluffing, the, the kind of the smoky and dark atmosphere about poker, which these days it's almost too scientific. So you miss characters like the Devilfish. Dave Ullier really, I think he pretty much invented poker in the UK. I mean, he, for me personally, I, he, um, I probably learned more from him uh, than just about any other player because you know, I had the Brazilians talk about total football. You know, Dave was total poker. He, he used everything about himself. He, he used his personality and he, he was so quick. He spotted opportunities, little things that he could use um, to do a little deal, to say something, to influence somebody. I mean, people talk about speech play now and a lot of the time they're talking about somebody, you know, trotting out some catchphrase or just making so much noise that, that a person can't think properly, you know. And um, that's not speech play. What speech play is, it was what Dave was preeminent at, was that he was thinking all the time. He was watching everything. He was listening to everybody. And if he spotted an opportunity to say something that was going to influence the game in the way that he wanted to, he would do it like a shot. He was so fast, Dave, and he was so funny. Phil would hate to See, call. See, Andy, I limped in to, to trap him again. <laughs> I think he hit another. 
think he sucked out on me again, Andy. Is that the only Bill way? has imaginary friends. But I also know family. that he was going to call a raise. Have I got anybody on the <laughs> So I was, there was a double context. It was said, let's trap Devilfish. If he raises, I'm going to at least call, of course, as you can see. How much do you pay in psychiatric bills a year? That's what I want. <laughs> <laughs> it's therapy. I have to work. Phil has made a, the incorrect fold. It was a great bat by Devilfish. He's kept the momentum. He, he had this thing of being fully aware of everything that was going on and taking in a lot of information at once. Because um, there were so many little things. Oh, this guy's tired, this guy's annoyed, um, this guy's just lost two pots in a row and he's, he can't wait to play another hand. This guy's looking away, trying to pretend he hasn't got a big hand, whatever. Dave's taking it all in, all the time. So you fall for six, but you don't fall for two. OK, I got you, so still. Get on to the next one now. <laughs> he understood strategy, he understood people. He knew where he was with people, both on and off the table, actually. And uh, so he was able to manipulate situations, um, get the best out of situations, get information that other people wouldn't have got, put things into people's heads that you know, other people wouldn't even think to do. So, you know, he, like I say, he used everything about himself. It was a joy to watch and an education to watch. Personally, um, I learned more from him than any other player. How great a player was Dave? I've heard a lot of people say that when he was running well, especially at Pot Limit Omaha, he was probably one of the best in the world. And also, he won a, num a great deal of money playing No Limit Hold'em as well. You know, he had a, certainly a WPT bracelet. I think uh, as the game progressed and as a lot of the young kids started to play, you know, game theory, optimal poker, and uh, you had your, your Phil Galfons and people like that really studying the game intensely and spending hours and hours in group forums and chats. Then maybe, I think, possibly Dave started, he may have started to get a little bit left behind. I, d I, would, never, I would never want to, to feel that, but he still held his own against them a lot. You know, in cash games, you would often, you would often, you would often see him in, in, you know, in Bobby's room at the Bellagio, you know, a huge stack in front of him, telling loads of silly stories. I've never seen anyone destroy cash games the way he could. If he's on a bad run, he's awful. He would just do the lot. But if things are going well and, and he's got a good read on the table, then I, you know, I've never seen anyone who's so fearless and so easy to uh, just clean up the table. You know, I didn't just see him do it once. I saw him do it 20, 30, 40 times. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't a fluke. The guy was an incredible player. So, you know, it was great to watch him at his peak. You know, and the same in No Limit, you know, because he was so famous, he'd sit down at the table and people wanted to play with him. So it was a kind of a, a no win or a no lose situation, sorry. Like if they got beat by him, they could say, oh, you never guess who knocked me out. And, and if they beat him in a hand, then that was their story, you know. So uh, this used to happen a lot to him, but it is the same as it does with the top American players. And, but as a result, he used to get a lot of chips, you know, because people would play bad against him. And um, once you give a, a player as good as him, you know, a big stack, he, he, he knows exactly how to use it. I think maybe his finest hour, Dave won one of the early WPTs, but uh, the final table, I think Tommy Grimes was at the final table. Uh, Phil Ivey was definitely at the final table. Phil Ivey would love to take down the man they call Devilfish. He's swinging back hard. Well, the Devilfish has got him down. He certainly doesn't want to double him up here. Mike Sexton, uh, you know, who did the commentary for, was it 12 or 15 years with the WPT, he said, and he has said it to me so many times, I'm fed up listening to it, but he said that that was the single most dominant uh, final table performance in the whole history of the, of the World Poker Tour, and nothing before, nothing that came after ever matched it. I mean, Phil Ivey was at this final table, and there was only going to be one winner here. It was Dave. Classic battle of hands. Let's see what happens. Oh, it's a four. That's it. It's over. Devilfish makes a straight on the next card off the deck. Woo. He needed a four or nine. The four, four pops right off. Fish. He is outdrawn Phil Ivey. He's going to take Phil this title in the $589,000 first prize. At the height of his powers, and he ran all over them. And now, to our runner-up, Phil Ivey, our champion, Devilfish Elliott. Cheers. 
the winner of the Jack Minion World Poker Open. When the fish was on form like that, he was uh, very, very hard to deal with. And then, I mean, the fact that he ran all over Phil Ivey speaks volumes. successful at the poker table for a number of reasons, but I think um, basically it's his, um, it's his mold really, he's got a lot of nerves of steel, I've sat with him at many cash games and poker, poker games, when uh, Dave is so unpredictable, he's very good at the bluff, uh, he's very good at reading people, he's got like a sixth sense in that degree, uh, it's hard to put into words exactly what's what with him, but he has got a lot of courage, a lot of balls. He's uh, very brave, very determined, and doesn't like losing. I've known Dave since I was seven years old. We grew up on Springbank, in Stanley Street, on the council estate. And first got to know Dave, because um, my dad used to go in the bookies, and Dave was always in the bookies, and he always had like a little crowd around him because he used to bat quite heavy. Well, everything what he got. And when I used to say heavy, it was sort of like, you know, 20, 30 pounds. And we're talking back um, sort of mid 70s. Um, so it was always action around Dave and it was always a laugh. We're on uh, Stanley Street off Springbank in Hull. And uh, this is the, uh, the place where my nana and my granddad lived. And uh, my uncle Dave, my dad and my auntie Janet was small children living here until there was adults and moved on into their own worlds and own lives. Hanging around the, uh, the betting shops, the bookies, the snooker world, trying to hustle a couple of quid here, a couple of quid there, uh, and snooker, pool, horse racing, you know, try to rob the bookie. You don't realise if I lose this, I don't eat for a month. He used to have a mirror on the end of his queue so he could watch his hair at the same time as his shot. Hup, hup, nothing. Yeah, get me out of this one, I'm going to play a swerve shot, yeah? Last time we did this, put his shoulder out. Ah, uh, baby doll. There you go. But that was in. It's not bad. We was pretty streetwise kids. We knew everybody else as well, and everybody knew us, and we, we all sort of like got along, but uh, things was tough, and it was hard then, back then. We used to go out to all the rough pubs and all pretty, you know, rough, rough places, and Dave was always in the centre, the centre of that, you know. Yeah, he had a fight in here once. I remember him had a fight in here with uh, a taxi driver. Uh, but he used to have a very, really bad temper. Really bad temper. When he was, when he kicked off, you didn't want to be around him. It was quite violent. He fought this guy and uh, he pummeled him. There was blood everywhere. Uh, he didn't care, you know. He, he used to like to try and poke people's eyes out, he did. He always just said that to me. He said, I'll poke his eyes out, and he did. He used to go for eyes. Yeah, it was quite an hard case, was Dave. So. I think that was his upbringing. I think he was always ducking and diving through his younger days. I mean, if you read his book, he talks about jumping out of windows and, and, and cracking safes, and uh, he was always looking over his shoulder. So I don't think he trusted a lot of people. I think Dave just wanted to be, was, a, was a bit of a loner, really, and I don't think a lot, not a lot of people got to know him as, as, as well as they thought they did. Big name, the Devil Fish. He got his nickname when he won his first World Series of Poker Bracelet in Vegas. Dave has been around the block. Baby, we didn't have a spit to slide on in the early in the early years. I mean, the house that I lived in was so small. If you forgot your key, you could put your hand down the chimney and open the door from the inside. And the furniture was actually painted on the walls. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, I mean, that was tough days. I mean, my mum used to send me to the butchers and say, "Go get a sheep's head and tell them to leave the legs on." I mean, we were skimp, baby. But anyway, um, you know, things have improved. I travel around the world. I stay in the best hotels. I've always got the most beautiful girl on my arm. Um, limousines everywhere, it's great, you know, I mean, it's, it's the James Bond lifestyle without the bullets. Back in the day, he was known as a bit of a rogue, uh, a gambler, he'd gamble anything, 
And if uh, he'd ran out of money, he'd go out and try and get it. He, was all, he always had his hands on money, Dave. Um, his, um, his niche was trying to rob safes and antiques. He'd, he wouldn't rob a house and, you know, uh, take videos and stuff like that. He'd go for the big bucks. And then he'd go back to the bookies or back to the casino. And then um, he would uh, try and, you know, double his money up, etc. and start from there. Um, when he got introduced to poker, he always used to play cards. There was always a card game in, in um, Payson's Park uh, with, you know, the local villains, if you like. And um, it wasn't until around about 92, 93, when he, uh, he got introduced to Texas Oldham, he started to become successful. He used to have a backer. His father-in-law used to back him, I believe. Dave could, could hardly you lose it because it was a non-shuffle game. And he used, to, uh, he used to win quite a lot of money at that. And that's how he got his tank to go to Vegas. And he went to Vegas and won a World Series of Poker. Nobody knew him. Bearing in mind, We've come from the, the states of Hull, the stories I've just been telling you, and I'm going to Las Vegas with him. We're pulling up in limousines, we're walking into the casino, and people are, are wanting, running up, wanting to photograph with him and autographs and all this sort of thing. And uh, it was like being with a film star. He always used to wink at me like that. I was in the Bellagio one night and uh, was having a meal. And he said, uh, he just come up, he said, uh, he said, we made it, kid. So I said, nah, I said, you made it, I ain't. He said, oh yeah, you stick to your windscreens, I'll carry on doing this. And that's how he was, and we laughed all night about that. So you get one off the bet, Dave, come on. Should have had a bet. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> he didn't dwell on, I'll tell you another little story. He was in Paris, and did won $25,000 at Euros in a, in a cash game, and they paid him out in Euros in uh, two bags. In them days, the, they never used to pay in transfers, and that, they paid you in cash, so you needed somebody with you or you had to be cute. So he went to the um, hotel. He said, I woke up in the morning. I went with him this trip. He says, I woke up in the morning, he says, I was starving. He says, uh, I thought, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go and go up downstairs. So he gets dressed, I'm very shallow, he gets dressed, I said, what am I gonna do with this money? And Dave used to think, when he had money in the house, which he had loads, he always used to hide them in the toys and stuff like that. He knew where to hide things, because don't forget he was a thief. So, he said, you know what I did? He said, I put it in the bin. And I got some paper and so on, like put it on top of the bin. Oh, good idea. Went to bed, just come back to fucking clean, as he says, being in. He emptied it, gone. Went downstairs and got the cleaner. No, I didn't see it. I just put it straight in the bag and went into the incinerator. Whether she did that, I don't know, but it lost 25,000 quid by putting it in the bin. We're going to bed first. Never mind about it. Never mind about it. And he wasn't wealthy then. He was, he was, you know, he was on his toes, like we used to say on our... He was on his toes trying to make a living. When Dave said he was on his toes, he was on his toes, you know, getting around trying to make a living. And uh, he was, he was, he had money, but we can lose 25 grand like that. But to him, it's just another hand. It's not the end of the world, you know, I mean, I'm a good-looking guy and I've got a great sense of humor, you know, and I have a good life, and who cares? I? Dave was always upbeat, yeah, and no matter winning or losing, and, and obviously being a gambler, that's, that, that's part of what it was about. You had to take your losses with your wins and your wins with your losses. And Dave knew that, the, the best of the rest of them. He wasn't afraid of anything or, or anybody, and maybe that's what people did or didn't like about him. I, I don't know. What motivated Dave? I think he cared an enormous amount what people thought about him. He also, I think he loved his family and he wanted to do as much as he could for them. So he was driven, you know, to make money and make their lives better. Um, I, you know, I think he loved the game, he loved gambling and you know, there was nothing else he would rather do 
than, than if he wasn't poker playing, you know, it would be sports betting or whatever. So I think he was motivated by the love of the game, the love of the life. Well, he liked to have the spotlight on him. He liked to have attention and there was no better way than poker, but if we weren't playing poker, he'd, uh, he'd be at any piano or you know, guitar that was available, any microphone. He'd be doing his Elvis or whatever. So, you know, he did, uh, he was motivated by, by having the spotlight on him. But I think, you know, he just, as much as anything, gambling was in his blood, you know, and um, he, you know, he was never happier than when he was gambling for high stakes. How do you get over a bad beat? I usually try and kick the guy who gave me the bad beat in the uh, cojones. But if you can do that, and go for a little walk. If you're in a tournament, go around for a walk, cool down. If you can't do that because you're playing on a TV table like this, just take some deep breaths, baby, because uh, that happens in poker. If it weren't for the bad players being in there trying to get them, uh, trying to put them bad beats on you, there'd be no loose money in the pot, so got to take it on the chin. I was playing in uh, Nottingham on the table, and he was uh, playing actually a bigger game in, uh, in, the, in the private room. And we were playing a 5-5-10 game, pot limit Omar or something. And there were four or five people left on the table. It was late in the morning. And he get out of the other game and he walks over to the table to say hello. And then he looked at the game and then he said, mm, OK, I have a go. And he said to me, after two hands, he said, how are you doing here, mate? He said, hey, you know what? You're the same age like me. Um, you know, it would be good if you... I've done a checkup, he said, it would be good if you do a checkup because, you know, we're good, we're strong, we're healthy, but he said, we live a different life. And uh, it's always good to have a checkup because then you know in time if something is wrong, then he said, you can... Uh, uh, you never know. And then he played his hand. But it came out of nowhere. So the game died off, kind of. And uh, I went over, short to the bar, and then meet him again. And I say, hey, devil, listen. And I sit down and I say, so what's really going on? He say, why, what? I said, don't act stupid. I know you a long time. I can read between the lines. I said, what's going on? He said, well, you know, I had a good life. And I looked at him like, what? He said, but uh, to find something and I think it's not gonna take long. I don't have too much time left. He said, but if I wasn't that stupid and I could have a checkup, in time, they could have avoided it, and now it's too late. He said, well, they give me another three, six months. And I was out for the count, like, you don't, you don't know what hit you. And then uh, he said, but don't tell nobody. I said, no, no, he said, you don't tell nobody. And I say, no. Obviously, Marcel comes straight to me <laughs> and says, listen, I need to tell you something. Delfish doesn't want anyone to know, but this is the situation. And uh, he's, he's been diagnosed with cancer, but he just wants to go rock and roll lifestyle, enjoy himself with them, and then drop off one day. And he said, oh, I can beat anything, blah, 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 blah. But I could tell in his eyes that, that, that he knew he was going to have some problems. And he told a couple of people. That pissed me off. I, I, I spoke to his, his best friend at the funeral, and he, and he said to me uh, he'd, he'd been suffering from stomach pains for, for some time, eventually went to get a check-up in December, uh, got called back in February and was told he had six weeks to live. Um, I was on holiday in Thailand with my, uh, my best friend, Nigel, and um, I got this message saying, uh, Dave's got like a week to live, you know, and I actually thought it was a joke. Uh, so, because uh, that would have been typical, but anyway, I rang a close friend of mine and, and, they, and unfortunately they said, no, it's true. 
Um, but it was already at that point the, the, uh, they'd said that it, the family said that they weren't um, letting anybody see him. So obviously he was, he'd obviously already deteriorated. And the only person who went to see him uh, in the literally in the next day or so was Rob. Uh, he went up to see, uh, see Dave and sat with him. I think the night before he died, I was with him. I thought he was going to die that night. Um, and uh, he was still saying to me, uh, you know, what we're going to do next year. And he knew and I knew the situation. Um, and he asked me to do some things for him, for his family, and just guarantee that some things, some things would be looked after. And, uh, you know, I did that. So that was kind of our last our last conversation, really. I mean, it's hard to imagine the guy's dead because everyone still talks about him all the time. I mean, it was just a great character, just a great character. I didn't really want to believe that he was ill. It's hard, you know, it's like, it's like with anybody who's, who's so, you know, who's so powerful and so amusing. You, you kind of think that they're immortal. You, you can't believe that they, that, you know, that something, that something could take them down. You know, he didn't smoke. He was relatively, obviously he didn't lead, he didn't lead a massively healthy lifestyle, but he didn't, he, you know, he, he looked after himself. He was, you know, he, he was a fit, he was a fit guy and he didn't, and when I heard that he had terminal cancer, I thought, it's just not right, you know, it's just not right. I've heard people say that right up until right, right up until his last breath, he just he kind of didn't accept it, and I kind of like that. You know, I love the idea that he really felt that he was going to be playing in a, another tournament in a week's time, or, or you know, or that he, he, he never, he ne you know, that, that whole thing about surrendering to death, and that some people do it, and some people rage against the dying of the light, and they, and I think that that David, I wouldn't say he was raging against the dying of the light, but I think what he was doing was. Just not, just, I don't want to believe this. You know, I'm just going to, I'm going to crack on with my life. I'm going to crack on with my life. I'm, I'm going to beat this as well. I know I've got a few illness complications and things like that. But um, it, it was too, he was too young to die. It was so brave, it was unbelievable. Like, he wasn't scared of dying one bit. He was, like, not even, like, worried. The only concern was, was his kid and his wife and his, his ex-wife and his family going to be OK. I mean, he was completely, uh, co completely brave. Uh, and, uh, you know, his view was that he'd had a good life. He lived his life the way he wanted to live it, on his own terms. So screw everybody. I will always really remember being in touch with him the week before, going, we need to get you in the Poker Hall of Fame. And he's like, nah, nah, whatever. If they don't want me in there, that's it. But I knew it, I was like, I knew the Americans would get wound up by it, because Devilfish winds the Americans up when he went up there all the time. But some of them didn't get him at all. So yes, we had a conversation, and you know, on a personal level, I said to him, we're gonna get you in. And it kind of helped drive me forward when it, once he died. I thought, I really want to, fulfill on this promise for a friend. I was absolutely delighted that, that, that Dave got the Hall of Fame recognition that he got. It was a shame it didn't happen in his lifetime. Uh, I know how much it would have meant to him, more than it would have meant to just about anybody else. Um, I mean, I think he didn't need it because you know, we all knew who Dave was. We all knew he was the best. We all knew that you know, he, he was UK poker, he was European poker, he was unique. He represented a time, he represented a place, he represented a way of playing which no one will ever emulate or surpass. Um, but I also know that, that he would have loved to have known that, that his name was up there with the greats, with the immortals of the game. But, uh, you know, it was very, very right very right that Dave should get that, and we feel that he got it for all of us. When, you, when it comes back to, you know, who did most for the game, 
who promoted the game, who, who changed the world of poker. Devilfish had actually picked up the game of poker and carried it on his back. So uh, I was delighted last year. I got a, a message from uh, Daniel Negrianu who said, uh, you know, you might like what's going to happen in the Hall of Fame voting. And uh, so this year he finally got in. It was uh, better late than never. And I think um, I was thrilled because it was a recognition that there was a European who, who was out there and, and who had done the whole thing. The devil fish, as usual, got the last say. You got about a five to one chip lead on me, you little bastard. I think I will just summarize him as uh, being unique, proud, um, smart, savvy, and with, uh, with his heart in the right place. That's probably his best quality that wasn't always apparent um, to everybody. I don't think there'll ever be another devil fish at this stage. You know, the, you know, the leading players of this generation are mathematical, uh, you know, they're doing yoga, and you know psycho psychology classes and things like that and he'll just go that's a load of rubbish probably is what he would say <laughs> as the phrase goes we will not see his like again it was unbelievable the first time i mean it's hard to it's hard to believe that there was one day bully at one devil fish there's certainly never going to be two Each year, uh, we have an event in, uh, in Las Vegas. We take qualifiers to Las Vegas. And uh, one of the things I do is take people down to Binion's, which is where the World Series of Poker started. And uh, he will now be uh, immortalised in the Hall of Fame there. A picture will be up on the wall. But what they also have there is a poker table. And they got a lot of famous poker players to sign it uh, a few years ago. And Dave in the corner uh, put um, uh, a slogan, which is, I've got it here, actually. Life is a blast but it don't last, live it long and live it fast. Dave Devilfish Elliott. And that sums up the Devilfish. Okay, a friend of mine, Peter Chan, who used to be a moneylander and a bit of a boy, he gave me the name the Devilfish, which apparently is the blowfish, which when not prepared properly when they cook it, if they don't take the poison out, it kills them. Because I used to kill them all, baby, okay? Full stop. <laughs>